Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Be sure to follow us, by the way, on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com forward slash UNC knowledge. A professor at the University of Chicago for more than three decades, Dr. Gary Becker is a founder of the Chicago School of Economics. He is a winner of the John Bates Clark Medal and of the Nobel Prize for Economics, which places him in an unusual position in the field of economics. He has nothing left to prove to anyone. <laughs> Dr. Becker publishes regularly, maintains a full-time teaching load, and blogs on the Becker Posner blog, one of the best read blogs on law and economics. Several times a year, he visits us here at Stanford, where he is a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Gary Becker, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Segment one, what happened? 1983 to 2008, the American economy grows, a quarter of a century of growth, marred only by two brief, shallow recessions. And then in the beginning of the autumn, beginning in the autumn of 2008, a credit crisis, and in the months that followed, perhaps the worst economic turmoil since the Great Depression. What hit us? Financial crisis is what hit us. We had over particularly the period um, in the 2000s, great expansion of credit. Uh, banks were very exposed in the housing market and elsewhere. Uh, an expansion that was partly the fall of the banks who, who expanded, and partly the fall of the government and, and the Fed who kept interest rates low uh, uh, during particularly 2004, 2006, and Congress, and um, who urged uh, the banks to be lending to low-income groups with low credit. So we had the Community Reinvestment Act that began actually in the 1970s, mm -hmm. but then the great push began in the 1990s and then in the 2000s to lend more and more to these groups who really didn't have the credit rating or the income that they could in any realistic scenario about long-term prices, housing prices, payback. So you put all these things together, and we did have an enormous financial crisis that then spilled over and affected the economy as a whole. And so while the financial crisis was the worst we had since the Great Depression, there's no doubt about that, the real economy effects were among the worst, I mean, it, but it wasn't so far worse in, in the 70s and even the early 80s and so on. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are mm -hmm. others that were close to it in comparability. Gary, here, the um, conservative that I am, I'm perfectly, it makes all the sense in the world to me that the government was involved in this in one way or another. The Fed is too loose with money. Barney Frank in, the, in Congress is pushing uh, credit to people who can't afford it but that the banks got it wrong, that they didn't understand their own exposure, that people who are extremely well paid and in a highly competitive environment. So I feel, well, let's put it this way, when Alan Greenspan testified before Congress in 2008, I felt for him. Let me just read this to you. This is Greenspan testifying. I, Alan Greenspan, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of banks and others was such that they were, they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders. The loan officers of those institutions knew far more about the risks, I assumed, involved in the people to whom they lent money than even our best regulators. A critical pillar to free markets did break down. That shocked me. I still do not fully understand why it happened." Close quote. Did you feel his shock? Do you? What? <laughs> well, I was, I, I, I don't know if I, a shock, but I was, um, Disappointed, and uh, and it's it's a you know a challenge to understand what went wrong, what I think went wrong, um, and leave out the government and the Fed as you All said right. that that was a contributor clearly a, a significant contributor, but they weren't the only ones. I think Greenspan is absolutely right. Um, I, what I think happened was that banks, and including very able people, like I once asked a, a, a very eminent banker who survived pretty well the crisis. You know, what about the head of Lehman? What was he? He said, no, as far as you know, he was a very able person. Full, I think his mm -hmm. name was. I think the banks didn't understand the risk that they were dealing with. They thought they were diversified. They had uh, credit protection. They had, you know, uh, the modern securities with derivatives and the like, uh, which enables one to take on more risk but to diversify it uh, to a large extent. Not that you were bearing no risk, but you thought you were hedged pretty well against risk. Now, it turned out, 
I think, that neither the financial theorists who created a lot of these new instruments, the derivatives and like, nor the bankers understood fully the risk properties of these assets that they were holding. That they weren't capable when everybody was in somewhat trouble, like in a run on a bank. Right. Uh, a bank can handle 2% of the people running on it, maybe three, but it can't handle a run on the bank. And, right. and when one bank gets run on, other banks get run on. Well, something in that ballpark happened during this crisis. The banks were, uh, the investment banks were holding uh, assets that had greater risk if a, if a general difficulty occurred than they appreciated that they were holding. And greater than regulators appreciated. Regulators, nobody knew yeah. where this, nobody expected this. Yeah. Regulators, for sure, they had the power to stop a lot of this. Uh, so people say we need more regulation. I always answer them, but the regulators had the power in the past. They didn't use it. What makes you think they'll use it in the next crisis? I hope it's not so severe, but there will be further crises in the future, no matter what we do, uh, hopefully of a, a less severe magnitude. All right, segment two, trying to fix it. February 2008, President George W. Bush signs into law a $168 billion stimulus package. This is almost entirely tax rebates. October 2008, Bush signs into law the Emergency Economic Stabiliz Stabilization Act, a major component of which is the $700 billion Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. Grade the Bush administration's response to the crisis. Well, Mixed, I would say. I mean, I don't know if you, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I usually give A, B, C, and D. I wouldn't get an A, um, uh, but I wouldn't give them a C either. I would give them somewhere in the B, B minus. Uh, B. And partly um, because it, it caught everybody unaware. Uh, so, you know, how to react to it. We weren't prepared in, in the reaction to it, whether it would have been Bush or anybody else in power, I think we weren't prepared. So if the well. president had called the University of Chicago Department of Economics and said, Dr. Becker, convene your colleagues, let me know in 24 hours what I should do, I'll do it, you wouldn't have been able to tell him. We might have told him some things, but I don't think we would have had it perfect, let me all put right. it that way. All right. I don't think we would have had it perfect. First of all, it wasn't clear, and I'll say for myself, it wasn't clear to me initially how much the financial difficulties, which eventually became a crisis, would spill over into the real economy. I mean, sometimes there are financial problems and the real economy doesn't suffer right. so much. And for a while, it looked like that was going to be the situation in the United States. That was, that was uncertain. Um, in terms of the overall things that the Bush administration did, um, I think, I generally believe tax cuts are good. I think they're better than uh, uh, government's increased spending. So if I had to say which stimulus do I prefer, I'd certainly prefer the tax cuts that the Bush administration did than the stimulus package that the um, Obama administration eventually uh, did pass. Let me just get that out. Uh, February 2009, President Obama signs into law $787, $787 billion American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which we all refer to casually as the stimulus bill. Um, that's now up to something like $800 billion. Two intriguing facts about that to me. By August 2009, only about a fifth of that had been spent. As we tape this, only two-thirds has been spent. Okay. Well, first of all, it's long been known in the business cycle literature that fiscal stimulus in terms of government spending are bad counter-cyclical uh, policies because they take very long to get implemented. You have to first not only decide on the amount, how they're going to be spent, and so on. And no government has a whole backlog of, po uh, of pro projects that they can immediately implement. So even if you think fiscal stimulus in principle are a good idea, we know they don't work out very well because of the long lags in getting them spent. And we right. saw that in this episode. Secondly, the problem with the stimulus package that was passed was that it was directed, it was mainly not so much a stimulus package, although that's what it was called, but it was a attempt to reorganize parts of the American economy in terms of the sectors that Congress and the president believe were underfunded, not over on a, Oh, a few, too little employment or too much unemployment, but underfunded. They really wanted to see expanded. That's true why they supported you know, the energy programs within mm -hmm. that alternative energy sources. 
They supported higher education support and educational programs. Uh, they supported um, R&D. Some of those may have been worthwhile. They had very little to do with stimulating the economy because these weren't sectors that had much unemployment. So if, let's say you, you increase uh, research on wind power. Well, you're going to draw people who were doing research or engineering from other activities. These weren't unemployed people. Right. Unemployment is still, as in all recessions, right. heavily concentrated among the low-skilled, the low-educated people. The educated people, the college graduates, have really quite fine. low unemployment compared right. to others. The long-term unemployment, which is a serious problem when you deal with unemployment, is concentrated among the less educated and low-skilled. The stimulus package wasn't addressing their needs. Uh, so I thought at the time that it would be a failure. I still think it's a failure. It's not easy to get hard evidence to evaluate what the effect of the stimulus was on employment and so on. A lot of the claims that it created X many jobs is complete nonsense. They're counting anybody, anybody who's employed by the stimulus without saying, well, what would they have been doing otherwise? otherwise right. And that's the real test. So I think most of that stuff is, is worthless. Uh, and it'll take a while before we will really be able to evaluate. But my own belief has been that it was a failure. It didn't. It spent a lot of money and didn't do much in terms of creating jobs. Gary, you mentioned that you prefer tax cuts. I do believe that tax cuts are the right way to attack not only a recession that we a serious recession that we had, but also in, in, in what I consider the really the primary problem for the U.S. economy. How can we speed up the long-term rate of growth mm -hmm. so that Given that we have this debt, given that we have the entitlements coming up, that the economy will grow enough and we can keep spending from growing quite as rapidly, that if, the, if we can increase the rate of growth of the long-term rate of growth of the economy one, by one half percent per year, I think we can handle most of our debt problems pretty well and yet have a m much better economy. Segment three, the Fed. Um, Fed's response to the crisis uh, ben Bernanke helps engineer the takeover of Bear Stearns by J.P. Morgan, supports the seizure of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, agrees to the $85 billion rescue of AIG, helps Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson convince Congress to approve the TARP, and since then, the Fed has kept interest rates close to zero and engaged in the purchase of mortgage bonds, driving down the long-term rates and swelling the Fed's balance sheet mm -hmm. to some $2 trillion. You grade that. Well... <laughs> Some of those things, I think, were desirable, and some not so. But if, if, you, if you ask Milton Friedman, who was my teacher, one of the great economists of, of ever, but certainly of the 20th century, uh, he always said that if we have a financial crisis, he thought about it, you need a very proactive Fed. Um, they, they should be. Uh, you know, uh, buying assets, creating money. I mean, that's what they're doing, creating money, creating bank reserves, where hopefully we'll, we'll mm -hmm. create money, and putting pressure on interest rates. So, so some of that, I think, was desirable and important to do. Now, was it all desirable? You mentioned like six or seven different things right. that they did. Um, probably they went too far in the top program. They shouldn't have done, done as much. Um, on low interest rates, probably desirable to push interest rates down um, uh, uh, to some extent, although uh, uh, and to buy uh, uh, bonds. Unfortunately, they create a lot of excess reserves of banks, mm -hmm. and now over, well over a trillion dollars worth, and they, and they may go higher if they get QE2, uh, and that didn't stimulate much bank lending. So the question I would ask is. With all these reserves that banks have now, why aren't they lending more? That's to me is the a really important question. So there's no the the banks have more than a trillion dollars on their books in excess of their legal requirements. Right. That's what, and yet they're not lending. So we know the problem is not a lack of liquidity. Absolutely, we know that. Yeah, and is Bernanke now? He's signaled that he intends to keep interest rates low. He gave a speech. Uh, earlier in October, uh, suggesting that he's willing to go on buying mortgage bonds to keep long-term rates down. Yeah. Is that foolishness, misdirected effort? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't support the QE2, the second, QE2 is the, uh, second quantitative easing. <laughs> that's, that's what they call QE2. Um, uh, I wouldn't support that now. I think the banks have the reserves. I don't think creating more bank reserves is going to increase uh, lending. I think, uh, I think you have to think of the lending problem from a different direction and maybe the outcome of the election 
in a few days will help in that regard. I think businessmen in particular, the potential borrowers and investors, got frightened by a lot of the legislation that was being passed and being proposed by the new Congress and by the president. They got frightened by the health care bill, and I think it's a bad bill. Uh, for a variety of reasons. It raised the cost of business, particularly small business. I got frightened by that. I got frightened by the talk of increasing in, uh, taxes on higher income, what they call high uh, rich people, but higher income people, let's say. Uh, they got frightened by the, the uh, discussions of a tax on carbon. Uh, they got frightened by a discussion that we're going to tighten up on antitrust policy and uh, investigate business more, more closely. They got frightened by the attempt on uh, uh, discussions of consumer protection, which was embodied in the Financial Reform Act. They got frightened by Obama's continual discussion of those billionaires and how we're going, you know, we're going to be against the billion. I've met with some businessmen recently, some dineable Democrats, very wealthy people, who said this time they're voting for the Republicans. I mean, the attacks on, on business. And well, you given all, all given all that, I think business has been hesitant about hiring more and expanding in that kind of environment. And I think if I had to put a single my finger on a single factor that in my judgment was most responsible uh, for the fact that we didn't get more lending, I think you didn't get a big demand from small and medium-sized business that they wanted to expand in this environment. I think that's been a really major problem for the United States. And until we correct that problem, I think we're going to have a slow recovery. Gary, your friend, economist Alan Meltzer, wrote in the Wall Street Journal recently, President Obama could do more for the economy than Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke by declaring a three-year moratorium on new taxes and new regulation. Well, certainly on the new taxes, I agree. Uh, the only regulation I would like to see that uh, imposed that we raise the capital requirements on banks, particularly on the too big to fail banks. I see. We have higher capital requirements, so they can expand as much as they did during this situation. Um, now we, they've always had capital requirements, so this isn't saying, well, let's start uh, regulating something that we didn't regulate. I think they were insufficient. Uh, so that would be the one regulation I, I would like. On the other hand, I would like to take away some of the additional regulations that's embodied in the Financial Reform Act that gave a, gives a lot of discretion to regulators. The regulators were bad during the, this crisis. What makes one think they can be any better? So you, you want rules, right. not uh, uh, discretion. So I would have a simple rule about capital requirements. That I would have, but I would, at the same time, not not uh, simply add any other regulations. I mean, I, I don't know of any others that I want, but I would reduce some of the regulations that we have. I would take away some of the power from the regulators. I can recall having dinner with Milton sometime in the 90s when the economy was doing very well. And Milton was particularly cheerful because of the gridlock in Washington. We have a Democratic president who wants to give money to his people and Republicans in Congress who want to give money to their people and they won't let each other do that. If Republicans win in a major fashion, we're recording this a week before the election, do you expect the economy to improve? Yeah, I agree with Milton. I, I mean, I, I don't gridlock think... Gridlock will, will come yeah. back and help us. And <laughs> gridlock will save us. Yeah. Generally, neither party has done too well when they had... I mean, there are exceptions to this rule, but uh, uh, certainly it, it, for those of us who, who believe in small government, lower taxes, less regulation like myself... Um, uh, uh, gridlock can often be useful in the sense that you make it more difficult. You'll make it impossible, but you make it more difficult to greatly expand the role of the government. And I think that's good for the United States. It's good for most economies, but given this situation in the United States now, it's certainly good for the United States. Segment four, health care. This past spring, just after the passage of the new health care legislation, let's call it Obamacare, I interviewed you for the Wall Street Journal. You said, quote, it's a bad bill. Health care in the United States does have a number of weaknesses. Mm -hmm. This bill doesn't address them. It's going to increase health costs, not contain them. Increase costs. Why? Well, there are a number of things in the bill that are cost increasing. I'll start with one. 
major one. Uh, we had 45 million people who didn't have health insurance. Mainly these were young people. These weren't sick people, couldn't get, although a few of those, but they were mainly young people who made a calculation. They're pretty wealthy and they didn't have it. Okay, we brought them in. Now, there are ways to bring them in that I might have supported, but we brought them in in a very bad way. Instead of giving them a minimal catastrophic health care plan, which is one that could make some sense, we gave them a pretty, we require them, not just gave them, require them to have a pretty generous plan. And we raised the poverty level for which they would get subsidized by the government from simply the ordinary poverty level to like three times the poverty level. I don't remember the statistics now in my mind, but it was something like that. That's going to be a big uh, uh, force expanding overall medical spending. Secondly, one of the weaknesses in the American health care system, it's too employer-based. Employers get subsidies for providing insurance. We're one of the few countries in the world that have mainly an employer-based uh, insurance system. Instead of sort of taking that away, which would have been the right approach to do it, we expanded it. In fact, we've ta we, we now institute a system where we're taxing small businesses if they don't institute a health care bill. Now, I hear from some small businesses, they'll prefer to pay the tax right. than do it because they're obligated to have an expensive plan that they'll be liable for. But that's another uh, cost-increasing one. We did very little, if anything, to reform Medicare other than maybe having a lot of rationing and so on in Medi Medicare. What we should have done is made individuals responsible for a larger out-of-pocket share of their total expenses at all levels, including Medicare levels. Switzerland, my favorite example, Switzerland has on average 30% of total medical expenses are out-of-pocket. That is, they're paid for by the individual, either in terms that they take a big deductible or they have a big copayment. The U.S. average at the, before the passage of this bill was around 12%. The bill doesn't change it in any significant way. Gary, whether Republicans win or not in the election, this fact that we heard over and over and over again during the health care debate will remain a fact. We spend about 17% of our GDP on health care. The next most costly health care system, that of France, and then Switzerland comes third, are both about 11%, dramatically lower. What's going on? Well, there are a couple of things that are going on. One, we're giving people access to treatments that they don't act, get access to in France and Switzerland. So if you're an older person, now you can, uh, we, we say, well, they're, they're putting a big value on their life. You know, the French and, and the Swiss and a number of other countries are pretty callous when they're dealing with older people. They say, well, you don't have that long to live, and you know we're not going to. So not, we actually get something for the extra amount that we're paying. I think we do. I think we do. I mean, I think there are a lot of strengths in the American system. We've been the major innovator. They ride off of, particularly countries like France, ride off of innovations produced in the United States, and we're we're paying for that. So you look at most of the R and D in the medical area. Uh, from penicillin 80, 80, and the, after the war yeah. right through to the present time, it's yeah. happening here. It's happening here. So we've been the major innovator. In fact, because of the restrictions in Europe, a lot of the re, uh, research of drug companies that are based in Europe, but they sent their research into the United States for a, a variety of reasons. So we're, you know, we, we're producing a lot of the innovations, and we're giving greater access to the new drugs and so on. Well, that's expensive to do it. Is it worth doing it? A lot of it is worth doing in my judgment. Mm -hmm. I think people are willing to spend a lot uh, for even small improvements in their life expectancy, and the, uh, small reductions in the probability they're going to die in the next year or so. That's expensive, uh, but we're doing that. Uh, our system, as I said, is not perfect. I mentioned we'd like, I sh we should get rid of the employer-based health care. We should have people paying a bigger out-of-pocket share, but it would be a mistake to say everything about the American system is bad, and that's why we're spending so much. We're allowing people, we're giving people access to a variety of treatments that they cannot get access as readily in other countries. And I think a lot of that's good. When I interviewed you in the spring, you said repealing this bill will be very, very difficult. Now, even if Republicans win at the upper end of what some predictions now suggest they might win, they won't have the two-thirds votes in either house that they'll need to override presidential veto. As a practical matter, they won't be able to repeal Obamacare. So what, what, 
What should they do? I think you can make changes. You're not going to repeal Obamacare. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing you have to accept. And when crunch time came, probably a lot of Republicans wouldn't vote to completely repeal Obamacare. But you can push it back in various areas. For example, you can try, I mentioned one of the, I think, mistakes of the bill, weaknesses of the bill, cost-raising aspects of the bill, is that for these 45 million people or so who are being brought under, uh, provided with health care, you can scale back the uh, fraction of those people who have their care subsidized. Uh, you can scale back the magnitude of the ca minimal care that you are providing, make mm -hmm. it covering catastrophes is what a lot of people would like to be protected against. So if I have no health insurance and I, have, I get cancer and I go to the emergency room and I get treatment, I have to stay in the hospital, the taxpayer is paying for all that. Right. So you want people to have some catastrophic care. So you try to push in that direction and then you say only the you know, people who, are, who have really low incomes will be the ones who are subsidizing. Other people have to pay for it themselves. That would have, a, uh, I think, a, a beneficial effect in reducing the amount spent. It'll give you a more efficient system. You, another thing you can do, and which I didn't mention before, mm -hmm. you can allow people in one state to buy insurance from companies in other states. There, nothing in the bill speaks to that issue. That's something I think maybe you could get the, uh, the president to go along to with. Sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he would sign that. And uh, uh, so there uh, are. A few other things that I think you could do. So I would say, let's not think of it. If I was running the Republican Party, which thankfully I'm not, <laughs> what I would say is, let's not think of a, you know, uh, throwing the o Obamacare out. Let's think if we make it work significantly better. So maybe by keep doing this, maybe we end up with something that is better than what we had before. That's mm. the way I would approach right. it. Segment five, our final segment, Gary. What is to be done? Growth still sluggish, housing prices in many markets still sinking. Here in California, as many as a fifth of homeowners are underwater on their mortgages. Unemployment still at more than 9%. And a similar situation obtains in much of Europe. Let me give you two policy prescriptions, and you, you choose. How's that? Okay. Yeah. The British government. The new British government intends to eliminate its structural deficit of more than 11% of GDP in just five years. Government departments will see their budgets cut by an average of almost 20 percent. Half a million government workers will lose their jobs. That's one. Here's two. Let me just quote him to you. Economist Paul Krugman, writing in the New York Times just a couple of days ago, quote, Economies that have experienced a severe financial crisis generally do not heal quickly. America needed a much stronger stimulus program than it got. Maybe voters will have a sec second thoughts about handing power back to the Republicans who got us into this mess and give Mr. Obama a second chance to turn the economy around. So on the one hand, a model of austerity. Cut. On the other hand, Paul Krugman saying, we didn't spend enough. We need more stimulus and we need it fast. What does Gary Becker say? Well, I already said I didn't think the stimulus package worked, so I don't see the, that the second stimulus is going to work, work anymore. So, no, I don't support a second stimulus package. I didn't support the first one. In terms of the British approach, the uh, cutback, um, I would try to, if I was in Great Britain, I think a case, strong case can be made for trying to cut back government spending, uh, but not do it at the same time that you're raising taxes very heavily. Um, so you try to get the economy growing a lot. I wouldn't directly worry so much about the fiscal situation, but I worry about what policies growth. would increase the rate of growth of the economy. I think cutting back a lot of the government uh, sectors would increase the rate of growth of the economy. I think cutting back some of the taxes, uh, and I'm not an expert on British tax structure, but cutting back some taxes would increase the rate of growth of the economy. I think if you can grow the economy faster, which will include some cutbacks in government spending, or certainly slowing down the rate of growth of government spending. If you can grow the economy faster, that's the way you're going to get out of this financial and fiscal crisis. I think the British are more along the right direction than uh, people who speak about a second stimulus. And that, that's actually a very important point for, yeah. for the people yeah. who are going to be in charge soon. Cutting spending is not the end. 
it's a means, and you may want to proceed at a different pace from what you have in mind, because the end is growth. Absolutely. That's correct. Now, the Paul Krugman, here's, here's why I, one reason I tossed him at you is because he holds a Nobel Prize. He does. There are laymen, I'm a layman here, and I say to myself, now wait a moment, we had Reagan enact what, let's call it brief, broadly speaking, the Friedman Program or the Chicago School Program of, of limited government and tax cuts. We have 25 years of growth. And now, Paul Krugman, Robert Reich, Larry Summers, it's as if Milton Friedman had never been born and John mm -hmm. Maynard Keynes had never died. Mm -hmm. And how, so how is a layman to understand what is taking place in your profession? Not easy. Not easy, because Paul Krugman did some important work in economics, so his Nobel Prize certainly had, uh, had merit. He did important work in international trade, not on stimulus packages and the he's like. He's an economist of serious yeah, standing. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was a serious he was, economist. Right. He was. I, he's not doing serious work anymore, but he was a very serious and, and good economist. Larry Summers is an excellent e economist. I know him very well. Uh, Robert Reich, no, he wasn't really an economist. Um, he, he, I don't think his training is in economics. I don't think his training is in economics. I think it's hard for the Ameri uh, for any you know, any p population when economists don't agree on issues. Um, I think it's very difficult uh, uh, to. And here, uh, it's not I, a disagreement yeah, of emphasis; yeah. it's a disagreement about fund uh, very, about fundamentals. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what. Larry Summers would say if he was not in the government and so on. Uh, Krugman is not in the government, so he's saying what he believes. Um, uh, I think he, you know, uh, what I trust with the American people is they've always had a lot of common sense. And yes, they can't follow all the technical arguments from, from economists. They can give it a common sense touch. Is this, you know, is this consistent with my experience? Um, what, what, what have I gotten out of this stimulus package? They said they're going to reduce unemployment by almost two percentage points. We're, we're only down by like a half a percentage point from the peak unemployment, which is really very disappointing. So I think if you trust your common sense, you can't fully understand the argument. And there's differences. And, you know, these arguments aren't 100 percent settled. But you can say what looks like a more sensible policy that we, we trust the private, private sector to get us out in, of, of this and to grow us faster, or we trust government to grow us faster. And I think most Americans believe, and I think they're correct in that belief, that the private sector has shown that it performs better overall, not 100 percent, but better overall, despite the mistakes of investment banking, performs a lot better overall than the public sector does. And that's why country after country in the world, as like China and Brazil and even Russia, and India, for sure, have been pushing their economies more toward the private sector, not against the private sector, because they know, they've learned that experience. Gary, let me close with a story. You knew Milton Friedman very well. I was privileged to be an acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about a dinner I had with Milton just uh, 18 months or so before he died. I had, um, I had read Bill Buckley's book, God and Man at Yale, which had been published 50 years earlier. Mm -hmm. and. Buckley placed the locus of the statist impulse at Yale half a century ago in the Department of Economics. And what I had discovered uh, at Dartmouth, my alma mater here at Stanford, uh, that first-rate economics departments cannot be first-rate economics departments without a heavy emphasis on free market economics. So I congratulated Milton Friedman, far be it from me, but I congratulated him on having lived to see a major victory and Milton would not have any of it. He said, uh, we may have won an intellectual victory, but there's no evidence that, that there's been a victory in practical politics at all. The government continues to grow and grow and grow. Now, he was speaking at a time when Republicans controlled both Congress and the presidency. Do you, how, how, are you as grim as, in your view, as that? No. If there's such a dis disjunction between, <laughs> you're not, all right. <laughs> Because I think, Cheer me up. I mean, I th think if you look at a, at a global perspective, let's start out looking at a global perspective. There's no question the world, if you look at the last 30 years or so, has moved strongly in the free market direction. I think China started its reform in 1978. There were no private sector. Now private sectors, 
is more than half of the employment in the Chinese economy. State sector is still important, and there are lots of problems, but it's more than half. From zero to more yeah. than 50%. India started reforms in 1991 when the private sector was throated at every uh, point by restriction of what they could do. Now, the most robust part of the Indian economy is the private sector and get investments and so on going on. Brazil, uh, even under Lula, who was a, comes out of a trade union kind of socialist background, uh, continued to promote more or less the, the private sector. Even Russia certainly went away from communism and so on. So you look at the world as a whole, uh, uh, I would say Milton Friedman should should have been felt. I, I, you know, my his ideas or the free market ideas, and more generally, uh, have been extremely successful. Now, you have grandchildren. Fifty years from now, will they live in what you would still, what you and Milton would, would still have recognized as a fundamentally free country? Well, economists are notoriously poor at predicting fifty years from now. Um, I believe they will. I believe they will, um, you know, barring nuclear and all that, all these problems, I, I believe they will. I, as I say, I have a lot of confidence in the American people. Uh, I think they have basic common sense. Um, and I think common sense, I used to say economics is common sense sort of made more systematic and more, more formal. Uh, I have a confidence in their common sense. I don't think they're going to deviate in, in, to any significant degree or consistently against a, a, an economy that's basically organized by uh, private sector. And if we continue to do that, our grandchildren will be a lot well better off than we are economically and health-wise and the like, and it will be basically a free economy. Dr. Gary Becker, thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.